great delight and honor to have you tonight, Brother Gibbs. God bless you as you come to preach for us this evening. Thank you, Pastor. Again, what a privilege to be here. Uh, thank you for all the kindnesses that you've showed uh, my son and my grandson and myself, the beautiful room. Uh, you had my great fruit in our room, and you had my favorite fruit. You had Snickers and Reese's and Hershey's, fruit that is just endures forever. So thank you for all of that. And boy, have I enjoyed your music here. Now, I've said this everywhere I go. I believe in America it should be perfectly legal to shoot a bad choir. <laughs> you say, why would you say such a thing? Because a choir can dig a hole that no preacher can get out of. When a choir sings half-hearted, oh, it just buries everything. But boy, your choir here sang so phenomenal, and all the musicians. Uh, and like your pastor, I'm an old trumpet player from way back. And I always tell the young people, well, you want to check out all the trumpet players because they make great kissers later in life. They do phenomenal. Now, don't marry a tuba player. They'll blow your brains out, all right? You don't want to do that. No, thank you for all this music. You've touched our hearts. It's been a great, great blessing. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 14. Matthew, chapter 14. Tonight, for the next few moments, I want to ask you this question. Why would you waste your life? Why would you waste your life merely doing something great for God? You say, what? Why would you waste your life doing something great for God? Well, I thought it'd be phenomenal if I did something great. No, no, no. People that don't have God or his power do great things all the time. God doesn't call you to do great things. God calls you to do impossible things. Pick up any business journal. People that make no pretense of having God or Jesus in their life do great things. But you have the very power of God. And the God who wants to do not just great things through you, you have a God who wants to do impossible things through you. If you could do something impossible, what would it be? Now, maybe it would be some exploit for God, something that God's laid on your heart. Maybe if you could do something impossible, it would be in the realm of a relationship. Have you ever seen relationships get so shattered, so banged up and mercilessly pulled apart that you can't even remember how they got started? And you can't even figure out how did it get to where it is? And you say, boy, to put that relationship back is going to take something impossible. Maybe it's in the realm of health. A trip to a doctor can be a terrifying thing when the doctor says, these tests are showing stuff that's not good. What would it be that you'd like God to do that's impossible? Well, I have wonderful news for you tonight. God wants to do the impossible for you, his child. Listen to these few quotes. I love them dearly. A.W. Tozer, God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. I love this next sentence. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. George Mueller, the man with all the orphans to feed. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. The great missionary Amy Carmichael to India, when you're facing the impossible, you can count on the God of the impossible. I love this quote from Warren Wiersbe. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems unreasonable, and to expect what seems impossible. D.L. Moody, if God is your partner, 
Make your plans big and impossible. We say, Brother Gibbs, those are the words of men. Well, listen to these verses. Jeremiah twenty two seventeen. O Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth, and by thy great power stretched out thine arm. There is nothing, nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything, he asks, that's too hard for me? Matthew 19, 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Have you ever noticed we stop talking about the impossible? And yet we serve the God of the impossible. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. And Luke one thirty seven. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. What tonight would you like God to do? That's impossible. I've got good news for you. You're not limited to one thing. It would be wonderful if we're in the Bible, but it's not. If God said, as my child, you get five impossible requests. That would be great, but that's not in the Bible. Do you know what the number is in the Bible for you to do the impossible? It's unlimited. There is no limit on it. I want you to look in Matthew chapter 14. God says, you want me to do the impossible. He gives us a lesson here. It's the story of Peter walking on the water. And how many of you think walking on water is impossible? Hold your hand up, would you? If you don't think so, just go out here on this river and take a crack at it. But he said, I want you to understand, I am the God of the impossible. And I don't know what God wants you to do that's impossible. All I can promise you is he wants each and every person here to do the impossible. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus has just fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Now in that day, they only counted the men, but there would frequently be two to three times that number of women and children. So Jesus, out of nothing, has just fed somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20,000 people. And he did it with one little lunch that a boy brought, five loaves and two fish. And out of nothing, he fed all those people. And then when he was done, there were 12 baskets of food left over, more food at the end than at the beginning. He wanted to teach the disciples, I can create out of nothing. Now, please catch this. Your God doesn't need something to fix something. Your God has the ability to create out of nothing and fix it. The word used in scripture is the word ex nihilo. It's the word found in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created out of nothing. I love these scientists today that say, well, let us explain to you. It all started with a big bang. Yeah, but what went bang? Well, we don't know, but it started with a big bang. Well, who saw the bang? Nobody. Listen, our God didn't start with a big bang. Our God started with himself. And by his word, he created. Your God can fix everything ex nihilo, out of nothing. Now he's put the disciples in a ship And he's sending them across this lake. And for them to cross the lake was no big deal. They were fishermen. They were experienced mariners. But look at what it says. Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained the disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Now, I'll not preach on this, but boy, if the Son of God thought it was critical to get away and pray, 
When's the last time you got away to pray? To pray. Boy, I've been negligent on that in my life. Jesus did it. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship, now the disciples, in verse 24, was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. The disciples are in a ship, Jesus has put them in it, and they are in a hellacious storm, a fierce storm. A storm that has these disciples, including the mariners, terrorized. Because the wind was contrary. Every mariner knows, man, when you're in a storm, put the bow into the wind. But what do you do when the wind's coming from all sides? What do you do when it's coming from front, back, side to side? This storm has them terrorized. And they are caught in this storm for over nine hours. Now look at what happens. Verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, uh, please mark this down, that's 3 a.m. in the morning. That's the fourth watch of the night. Uh, I had this story all messed up in my mind, all messed up. Uh, I thought that Jesus walked in the water on a flat sea, and I thought he did it in daylight. And you know why I thought that? Because that's how flannel graph showed it. How many of you understand what I just said, right? That's how final have showed it. This was the middle of the night, and they are in a storm that is going to unravel these disciples. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now somebody says, how does he walk on the sea any way he wants to? <laughs> Boy, your God is all Powerful. The God who wants you to do the impossible regularly does the impossible. And when the disciples saw him, verse 26, walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. And the word cried out there was the word when somebody literally lost it. They have just screamed like teenage girls. They've lost it. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now that be of good cheer means literally get happy. They're in the middle of this incredible storm. Jesus is walking in the dark on that storm. His presence has terrorized them. They think it's got to be a spirit. Nothing human could do that. And yet Jesus, who was very God and very man, is doing it. Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now somebody is going to ask God for the impossible. Oh, they've seen the impossible. That's how he fed the 5,000. But now they're going to ask for the impossible. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, if you want God to do the impossible, there are four steps lined here. And I want you to jot these four down because I promise you, how many of you want God to do something impossible in your life? Th then listen carefully to these four. They're not complicated, and they're all in this story. Here's the first key. you got to ask. you got to ask for the impossible. You see what Peter did? Lord, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, all the disciples were in that boat, all of them. There could have been 12 water walkers that night, but only one asked. Now, it was not a good night to stand up. This was not a night you would pick to go water walking. And I can just see Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Andrew, and the others saying, Peter, would you sit down? What in the world are you talking about? You don't want to get out of the boat tonight. But because one man asked, God did the impossible. When's the last time you asked specifically? Uh, in James, where it says, ask and you shall receive. It's the word for asking with specificity. When's the last time you asked for the impossible? 
Brother Howell, I struggle with that. I have trouble just getting it. I mean, God, what I'm asking for is ludicrously impossible. And God says, ask and you shall receive. But then he says, you have not because you ask not. One man in the boat asked. People come to us with troubles all the time. And they say, Brother Gibbs, what should we do? We say, well, number one, praise God for the problem. In everything, give thanks. But number two, what are you asking for? They say, what do you mean? What do you want God to do? You have got to specifically ask. A young evangelist called my dad. And he said, I understand you have semi-trucks. My dad said, I do. He said, well, I've just come to town and I got a big tent I want to put up. And he said, my trucks are so shot, they don't have the power to pull the tent up. I wonder, could I have you come out and bring some of your trucks and help me get my tent up? My dad said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. He said, how many trucks do you need? He said, I think probably somewhere between eight or nine. And my dad said, I'll bring nine trucks, nine semis, no problem. Well, I was just a little kid, but I loved to ride in those trucks. And man, I'm in the truck riding along with my dad. We're going to go pull this tent up. And we got to this big field where this tent was laid out. And my dad got out and he's walking around looking at this tent. And my dad said to this evangelist, I don't know how to tell you this, but your tent is shot. Do you realize you got as much patch as you do tent? And the evangelist said, that's not accurate, Mr. Gibbs. I got 80% patch and 20% tent. He said, my tent is super shot. And my dad said, well, we're never going to get this thing up in the air. He said, we start tugging on it. it it's just going to come apart like you can't imagine. He said, I'll wreck your tent. He said, no, no, no. I know it's impossible, but we're going to get this tent up. And my dad said, well, when you say impossible, you're right. We cannot get this up. He said, well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. This young evangelist said, I'm going to walk over there. And he went a distance about from us to where that sign is that says, be strong. He laid down on his face on the ground and started crying out to God. He said, I'm going to ask God for the impossible. He said, now don't start tugging on this tent till I tell you, because it'll all come unraveled. But I'm going to ask God. And he walked over, laid down, and man, he started crying out loud to the Lord. Now, my dad's truck drivers, who were not saved men, came over and they said, what in the world is he doing? My dad said, he's praying. I said, man, we never heard nobody pray like that. And one guy said, you understand, he's asking God to do what can't be done. My dad said, I'm aware of that. By the way, the world ought to see us ask for what can't be done all the time. Remember, it's only impossible with man. It's never impossible with God. Now, I'm just a little shaver standing there waiting to see what's going to happen. Well, I couldn't believe it. Finally, after about 20 minutes, he's done praying out loud. He sits up, waves at my dad. He's still on the ground. He said, I'm going to keep praying, but pull it up. It'll go. My dad said, you won't be mad when it's all in pieces. He said, pull it up. Boy, they hooked it up. That tent went up. Man, it creaked, it groaned like nothing I ever heard. And when it was up in the air, the guy came over and he said, you see, I told you. I serve the God of the impossible. I serve the God. If you ask, he'll answer. This was for him I did this. Now, by the way, be careful. God says you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your own lust. You want to get God out of the picture, just start asking for selfish things. My dad told him, he said, boy, this is amazing what you've done here. He said, but if I were you, I'd get me a new tent. He said, nope, this is the last time I'm going to use it. Last time, because I'm going to start a church here. My dad said, really? He said, yep. 
He said, I'm going to rent a little abandoned movie theater that seats 80 people. And he said, I'm going to start a church there. My dad said, well, good for you. And then he said these words. He said, and I'm going to put the gospel on television. My dad said, you're going to what? My television was brand new. Most people didn't have a television. We didn't. To see television, we went to my grandparents' farm, and they had one. Most cities had no TV. And it was only on from late afternoon until early evening. He said, I just think we ought to have the gospel so that people can get saved off of television. My dad said, do you have any experience at this? He said, no, no. My dad said, do you have any educational credentials to do this? He said, no, I never graduated from high school. He said, when I was a senior in high school, my father died. And I had to go to work to feed my brothers and sisters and my mother. My dad said, what makes you think that you can get the gospel on TV? He looked at my dad and he said, because I asked. Because I asked. What are you asking for? What impossible thing do you want to see God do? Well, he started that little church. And then he started going up to Cleveland, Ohio. There was one station there at the time. Never forget, he walked in by the guy and he said, uh, I want you to put me on TV for free. And the guy said, why in the world would I let you on for free when I got people standing in line to pay me? He said, because I asked God. Nobody else in that line has asked God, but I have. The man got insulting. He said, listen, number one, I'm not putting any religion on my TV station. Never, ever. And he said, number two, I'd never put you on. Do you realize your pant legs don't even match each other? Do you realize you got two black shoes on that are not the same? And who in the world cuts your hair? You think I'm going to put you on TV? He said, Mr., you're right. But I have asked. And my God says, ask in faith, believing, and ye shall receive. Do you understand? It's not you who's going to do the impossible. It's God through you who's going to do the impossible. If you think it's you who's going to pull it off, then you've got a vanity problem. That preacher, every week he'd show up there and he'd say, are you ready to put me on? I want to be on your station for 15 minutes just so I can give the gospel. The guy said no, and the guy got nasty with him. He said, look, I'm going to start cussing you out, and he did. Well, that young evangelist was up there asking him to go on TV one Saturday morning. And when the guy had finished cussing him out, a lady sitting there at a desk said, would you do me a favor? He said, sure. She said, my sister's dying, and she's not saved. Would you come try to lead her to the Lord? He said, well, I'd be honored to. I'd be honored. She said, well, follow me in your car. Now, he thought she meant they're going to go to something in the area. What he didn't understand is the sister was 250 miles away. <laughs> so he's following the lady in her car. And pretty soon he's running out of fuel. Now he's blinking his lights and they pull over and he said, look, I'm running out of fuel and I don't know how to tell you this. I don't have any money for fuel. She said, that's okay. We'll get you filled up. She fueled them, and on the way they went. When they got there, this lady was in her last days. But preciously, she trusted Christ as Savior. He led that lady to Jesus Christ. When they're walking out of the house, this secretary who'd been following, she said, 
I want you to come next Saturday, and I'm going to put you on television. She said, well, that's a very kind thought, but the guy that owns and runs that, he, he's not too thrilled with me. She said, he don't own the station. I do. I'm his wife. <laughs> she said, he just acts like he owns it. My family owns it. It's my station. And I'm not putting you on for 15 minutes. I'm giving you a half an hour. And what I want you to do is repeat the message twice. I want you to do exactly what you did with my dying sister. I said, now here's some money. I want you to buy a suit. I want you to buy some shoes. And I want you to get a haircut. And you be up there next Saturday. Well, up there he went. At the end of that half hour, he said, if you trusted Christ, if you prayed that prayer with me, I need you to write me. And I remember this pre-internet, pre-anything like that. But he said, I want to get you in a solid, fundamental church. we got to get a Bible in your hands. You've got a lot to learn. I need you to write me. Well, that first week, 60-some people wrote him and said, I prayed that with you. The lady said, I not only own this station, I own two others. And I'm putting you on them. And she said, I know people who own other stations. And within one year's time, he was on 160 stations. What makes you think I'm going to put you on? I asked. Do you understand how powerful your ask is? Or has the devil bankrupted your faith? Got you believing that your ask isn't going to make a lick of difference. Ask in faith believing and ye shall receive. Whoa. Boy, you want God to do the impossible. That preacher before he was done was on 1,600 stations. And every week when he'd say, if you prayed that sinner's prayer with me, I need you to write. They would get between 26 and 30,000 letters a week saying, I prayed that with you. What do you want God to use you to do? Now it'll be different from person to person. And remember, you're not limited to one. You should have a list of impossible things you're asking for. But you've got to ask. Write the second key down. You want God to do the impossible, number one, you've got to ask. Number two, you've got to get your eyes off of the storm. Now catch this. If I'd have been in the boat, I think I'd have said, Jesus, I want to go water walking, but could you stop this storm? Uh, could you get the circumstances better, please? God's not going to fix the circumstances. That's what man does. Okay, Brother Howell, here's what we want to do. Now, how do we fix this mess? God says, why don't you leave the mess in my hands? You've got to get your eyes off of the storm. I can just hear the guys in the boat. Boy, that's crazy, Peter. Here we are, stuck in this storm for nine hours. But now he wants out of the boat. If there was ever a night you shouldn't go water walking, it's tonight. Can I help you? You will have no problem getting people around you to tell you tonight's not the night. Whoa. You want to see people say, what are you talking about? That's impossible. And just start asking God for the impossible. And, and I wish I would say, boy, people are just going to say, oh, that's great, that's great. That's not what I find. 
They want to focus on the storm, and they want you to focus on the storm. The storm in your life is no reason to not ask God for the impossible. No reason at all. Whoa. Peter, it's a night that howls. You guys have been paralyzed out here for nine hours. He said, I know, but I'm going water walking. You got to ask, and you got to get your eyes off of the circumstances. Yeah, but Brother Gibbs, I've messed up. How many of you in this room have ever messed something up? Hold your hand up, would you? How many of you, like me, are thrilled everybody doesn't know about everything you've messed up? You know what the devil says? Yeah. <laughs> he may do the impossible for her or him, but you? And you got your eyes paralyzed by the circumstances. Get your eyes off of the storm. Well, yeah, it may be another time. Man, I read all those things that people have done in the past, but that's a bygone age. No, no, no. Get your eyes off of the storm. The storm does not control the power of God. God's power controls the storm. You got to ask and then you got to get your eyes off of the storm, off of the circumstances. You're too young. You're too old. It amazes me. Nobody's the right age. <laughs> I, I, it just dumbfounds me how people want to say. It. Now, in the Bible, all these men that did stuff at 80 and older... And then we look at teenagers being used in the Bible. But we somehow think the God of the impossible is limited, is limited by the age of his child. Listen, God wants to use you now. You got to ask. You got to get your eyes off of the circumstances. Write number three down. We're almost done. You got to get rid of a plan B. You got to get rid of a plan B. Now, I just cannot make this one any clearer because, boy, it troubles me. Brother Willette, we're going water walking. And Jesus, we want to go water walking. But could you come this way a little closer? What I want to do is get you up closer to the boat. Now, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you're the God of the impossible. But just in case you don't come through, I want you a little closer. Because if somehow I start sinking, I want to grab the boat. The boat is my plan B. Boy, do I love a plan B. Oh, yeah, but Brother Gibbs, without a plan B, we could have egg on our face. Yeah like a young evangelist whose trucks are too shot to pull a tent up saying, I'm asking God for a television ministry. Get rid of your plan B. You got to ask. You got to get your eyes off of the circumstances. And you got to get rid of your safety nets. Now, wonderful people who love you will say, boy, this is challenging. But whatever you do, don't, don't throw away all your safety nets. Listen, you can trust him. Read Hebrews 11. Not one of them had a safety net. Not one of them. We say, man, I want God to use me. Not one person in Scripture had a safety net. What they had was God. God wants to fix your situation. Write number four down and we're done. You got to ask. You got to get your eyes off of the storm, off of circumstances. You got to get rid of your plan B. And then number four, you got to get out of the boat. You got to step out. 
Look at what it says there. Verse 29, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You realize God could have levitated him right up and over, but he didn't. Peter had to step out. What would it take for you to step out and do all of this? My dad celebrated his 80th birthday. And I said, Dad, what would you like for your 80th birthday? My mom was already in heaven. He said, you remember the evangelist that? I said, yeah. He said, I wonder if he could come. I'd just like to see him again. I said, sure, I'll try to track him down. I found he was living in California now, and he was not in good health. But I got him on the phone, and I said, it's my dad's 80th birthday. And I don't know, do you remember me? And he said, yeah, I remember you. You were the boy in the truck. I said, that's me. I said, any way you'd come across country, we were in Florida at the time, and be here for my dad's 80th birthday. He said, I wouldn't miss it. Well, he came, and boy, for my dad's birthday, those two men just sat there and cried, told stories about all the impossible things they watched God do. They couldn't stop crying, and they couldn't stop talking. And finally, I said to my dad, it's getting late. He said, leave us alone. Boy, it was great for him. Well, I told this evangelist, tomorrow morning I'll pick you up at 7.30 at your hotel. I said, now we're cutting it a little close. I don't want you to have to be at the airport too long. But don't miss this flight. And he said, I won't. Well, I got to the hotel at 7 o'clock. I couldn't find him anywhere. I went up to his room. I walked all around. I'm asking people. Have you seen this guy? He's always walking around carrying a Bible like this under his arm. Have you seen him anywhere? They said, no, no, no. Finally, a chambermaid came up to me, and she said, you know, I saw a guy with a Bible leading a group of men down a hall, and they're down this hall over here, and I think they're having a prayer meeting. I said, serious? She said, yeah, I walked down there. You know what had happened? He's standing out front waiting for me at 10 to 7. And a bus pulled up with all these executives from out of town who were there for a meeting with a Fortune 100 company. And they're all getting off the bus. And as they're getting off the bus, he said to them, you guys here for the big meeting? They said, yeah. He said, good, I'm supposed to take you to it. Follow me. <laughs> and he got them all to follow him right off the bus down the hall. And he gets them in this conference room he finds. And he said, this is the biggest meeting you've ever been in in your life. I'm going to tell you how you could go to heaven. Before it was done, he led 14 people to Christ. I said, preacher, you're going to miss your flight. He said, what does that matter? He said, this is eternal stuff. I said, wow, how did it happen? He said, when I left California, I asked. I said, God, I don't want to fly across country without a harvest of souls. God, you've got to help me. You know how hobbled up I am now. And he said, I asked God to bring a group of men to me. And he said, I'm standing out front, and that bus door opened, and here they come. And he said, when I said, are you ready for the meeting? They said, yeah. He said, God did that. That evangelist turned to me. And he said, David, you're asking for too little. He says, you're going through life, and you're not asking for enough. You serve the God of the impossible.
but you got to ask. And by God's grace, oh, this is critical. You got to get your eyes off of circumstances. It's never the right time to do the impossible. Never. Well, let, let's wait a year. It'll still be impossible. And circumstances don't govern the power of your God. Number three, you got to get rid of your plan B. Lord, I don't need a plan B. I got you. And then you got to step out of the boat. Out of the boat. I went back and told my dad what happened. He said, yeah, I know. I said, what do you mean you know? Last night he asked me to pray for a harvest. And he said, I've been fasting and praying all day for him. He said, you need to understand something, David. We may be 80 plus, but our God is still the God of that book. And by God's grace, we asked and God answered. You want the God of the impossible? Now, the devil doesn't care what you just heard as long as you don't do anything with it. What he wants is for you to leave your challenge, saying, oh, that's right, that's right, but not to do one thing about it. It's time for you to ask. You have the God of the impossible. Ask, and you shall receive. Bow your prayers. Father, thank you. Oh, forgive me for how many times I struggled and worked to pull it off myself when we have the God of the impossible. Heads bowed, eyes closed. How many of you say, Brother Gibbs, God spoke to my heart tonight. I want the God of the impossible. My heart's been touched. Hold your hand up right now. Hold your hand high. You got your hand up? Get down to this altar right now. It's time to ask. The piano's going to play. It's time to ask. Nothing can take the place of asking. You have not because you ask that. Oh, I promise you, I don't know what it is. Every one of us has got impossible things in our lives. For our kids, our grandkids, our lives, our ministries, our nation, our church. God, forgive us for not asking. You summon us to ask. And tonight, we're fixing that. We're asking specifically. I don't know what's in the hearts of these dear people, but you intimately know. And Father, by your grace, we want to see the God of the impossible. The God with whom all things are possible. Hear our cry. Pastor.